McAllister is a research scientist in Sustainable Production Systems, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. His research, again, is partly funded by AI Bio. And Tim is working on the challenge of ensuring that the food we eat uh, is free from any microbial contamination that could endanger our health. And uh, as the title suggests, this is not as clear-cut an issue as you might have thought. Tim. Okay, Th thanks very much, Jay. So I've been given the topic of food safety, there is no zero risk, and I'm hoping by the end of the presentation you'll have an understanding of, of why we need to be vigilant, why we will continue to meet, need to be vigilant, and why we'll always need to be vigilant when we're dealing with the microbial population and, and trying to manipulate that world. So I, I just want to give you some appreciation then that the microbes are part of the natural world and we have to accept that because we're also part of the natural world. And they live in some pretty uh, interesting environments. Like if you look at the deep sea events, uh, they're the foundation of the food chain in that environment. They live in the absence of oxygen under extreme pressure, about 4,000 PSI, about 100 times more than what you got in your car tire. Uh, there's no sunlight at that. They, they rely completely on chemotrophic reactions in order to derive energy in that environment. So there's an example of a very inhospitable environment of which bacteria do quite well in. They also live in our skin and in our digestive tract. There's actually more microbial cells in our body than there are our own cells. Uh, if I were to go on a weight loss program by losing the microbes that are on my body right now, I'd lose about five pounds. So there's an awful lot of microbes, about 10 times more microbes on us than there are actual cells in our body. And they live in the digestive tract of cattle as well. And in that environment, they perform a very important function in terms of con uh, converting that plant cell wall material into high value protein in the form of meat and milk. And then of course, I guess if you look at all those other environments you live in, it's not at all surprising that they're also in our food. Now most microbes in the environment are harmless and they, they don't cause us any problem at all. But under certain conditions, such as if we have a compromised immune system, there's a lot of opportunistic bacteria that will look at causing an infection under those conditions. There are bacteria that specifically have pathogenic traits, which enable them to either colonize us and they produce toxins that can cause us problems. Or we've heard an increasing amount about the antibiotic resistant bacteria, which we're having trouble controlling in hospitals. We actually have a, an MRSA outbreak in Lethbridge right now where they've got a ward of the hospital closed off to visitors because they have an infection on that ward that they're trying to control. So all of this is part of our, our daily lives and we have to face this and that these microbes are present in that environment and they're not going to go away easily. Now in the case of beef, the most notorious of those bacteria that causes problems is of course E. coli-157. And we've all heard about E. coli-157, our, our, our uh, latest encounter with it was related to the XL uh, incident of which we had the largest callback of beef in Canadian history. Uh, before that it was Walkerton. These uh, outbreaks and in, uh, interactions are occurring all over the world at, at numerous times during the year. So that's the one that beef is, is most uh, routinely associated with. Now, even in the beef animal itself, it's a pretty inhospitable environment. And I was thinking to myself, I was thinking about how could I come up with a demonstration to show you how inhospitable it is. And everybody is familiar with the uh, windows in the side of the cows that we have. So we can stick various things in there. And what I did is I, I headed down to Value Village and I picked up a couple of t-shirts. Now, as a, as a government employee, I have to disclose that uh, Kmart did not give me any remuneration for using this shirt. <laughs> but what I did is I, pot, I, I picked up two identical shirts. And what I did is I stuck, left this one outside, and then I stuck this one in the room. And I incubated it for 24 hours, wow. and then I took it out. And that's what it looked like. Now, when I showed this to my daughter, she thought it was fantastic. You know? <laughs> she, thought it, she thought it was a new fashion statement. But, so I was thinking about wearing it, but I, I decided not to promote it too much. So, so anyway, the rumen is also a very inhospitable environment. It's anaerobic. There's no oxygen there either. It produces a lot of acid. So most of the bacteria that end up going in and are consumed by the cow, they also die. They can't survive within that environment, but some can make it. Now, because of the density of the microbes that are within our digestive tract or within the digestive tract of cattle, it's an incredibly competitive environment. 
And there's actually a microbial war going on all the time where one strain is trying to dominate another. And the work that we've done shows that those strains probably change over time. Sometimes one army wins, sometimes one army loses. And the microbes have a variety of ways of trying to uh, increase their competitiveness in that environment. Uh, they produce peptides that inhibit their neighbors. Uh, they sequester food to keep the food supply away from their competitors. There's a whole bunch of variety of mechanisms that they use to carry out this war. So it's important to realize that that kind of uh, competition is going on all the time. And really what we're doing when we're talking about food safety is we're creating an environment in which it's unfavorable for certain parts of these populations to survive. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to put the odds against them. So when we do that, we really need an integrated approach and we need to apply it at the beef producer level, through to the slaughter plants, through to the retailer, through to the consumer. And we need to be vigilant all the way along that pathway and have multiple control points. The more control points we have, the more we reduce the risk of encountering uh, those pathogens, but again, the risk is never zero. Now, some of the research that we've done has been looking at battles between good bacteria and bad bacteria. So the good bacteria do not cause those pathogenic responses that I talked about earlier. The bad bacteria do. This is just a little example of one of the techniques we use. Uh, this is E. coli 157, a lot of E. coli 157 on a plate. And we have one bacteria called Penobacillus. It's growing here at number two. We plotted other bacteria at these other numbers, and you can see they didn't create a clearing zone. So this bacteria at this point was producing antimicrobial substances that prevented the E. coli 157 from growing. So we took that bacteria, we introduced it into cattle, and we found that it in fact did lower the E. coli 157, but it did not eliminate it. So often we're talking about a reduction in numbers, not an absolute elimination. Same sort of thing with vaccines, you know, of the Bioniche vaccine that's already available in the Canadian market. We've done studies with that as well. And in that case, we see that, yes, under some conditions, it is effective and it does lower the population. In other situations, less so. One of the major problems of that area is that often these bacteria live naturally in the intestinal tract of the cattle. They do not cause disease to the animal itself. So you're looking at trying to mount an immune response against an organism that lives there naturally. And that's incredibly difficult because, obviously, we don't want the animal... Um, mounting an immune response against all the bacteria within its intestinal tract, just the bad bacteria. We've also looked at a lot of ways of feeding cattle differently. I call this the E. coli 157 healthy selections. So we put together a menu and we've done research on most of these approaches uh, where you look at feeding various dietary ingredients. So if we feed more forage, that tends to lower the amount of E. coli 157. We did work on distillers' grains. We didn't find that it had any impact on E. coli 157 at all. There's work in the States that says that distillers' grains increases E. coli 157. And then there's a host of various plant extracts that have also been examined uh, for their ability to lower O157. In many cases, we did some work with uh, a seaweed product out of Canadian seed plants from Nova Scotia, and we did find that it did lower E. coli 157, but we're always talking about lowering never complete elimination. Same with the uh, addition to the water. So each of these represent a reduction in the level of 0157, but not complete elimination. One of the problems with those previous approaches is that they lack specificity. They affect good bacteria and bad bacteria. This approach only affects the bad bacteria, and this is where we're using phage. So phage are bacterial viruses, and you can see two phage here attached to the surface. So this is E. coli 157. And what these viruses do is they attach to the surface, they inject their molecular material, they commandeer the cellular machinery of the bacteria, and they replicate their own DNA or RNA. It depends on the, the uh, virus you're talking about. And by replicating that, then when they reproduce, they cause lysis, they break the cell apart, and then they can go out and colonize other bacteria. Now that's very specific. Those phage that we've selected only infect E. coli 157. They do not affect other types of E. coli. So that's it's a very specific, uh, and we've done a lot of work looking at looking at the etiology and ecology of phage and the interaction with the animal and the 0157. One of the things that we find is that we end up with a predator prey, sort of the rabbit versus the uh, fox type of scenario, where the phage go up, the E. coli 157 go down. The phage go down, the E. coli 157 go back up. We see that kind of change in populations. That uh, research and research in the States has actually resulted in a product that's now used to wash cattle before they go into the uh, slaughter plants where they spray phage onto the surface of the hides as a method of lowering 0157. But there has to be contact between the phage and the bacteria for this approach to work. 
And of course, there's routine things that are done in the, in the plants already, and there's been research going on for years in this area where they're using hot water, steam, organic acids. Uh, the latest uh, approach is the Caden Cattlemen's have just asked again for irradiation to be approved or as a method of, of decontamination within slaughter plants as well. So all of these are about creating environments that are unfavorable for those bad bacteria. Now, one of the problems we always are going to face and why I say we always need to be vigilant is because microbes are masters of adaptation. And unlike ourselves, where it takes thousands or millions of years for us to progress from here to here, except for this last stage, which seems to take about a week, <laughs> okay? And then it takes like, it seems like thousands of years to ever go back, and often you never go back. So that's, that's the situation with us, but, but in bacteria, you're really talking about changes in hours to days. So they're masters of evolution, and that probably speaks to their ability to colonize and live in such a wide variety of environments. And I've got an example of this. This is just some research that we did with our phage. So what we were doing is we, we got the uh, DNA fingerprints of the E. coli that we can introduce into the animals. Oops. Which is shown here. So we know what each of these E. coli look like. Uh, and then what we did is we treated the animals with phage once we had put the E. coli in. And then what we found is that we found that there was a couple of E. coli 157s that came up that differed in a single band or were missing a band, or in this case, uh, had a band here that, that emerged in our unknowns, which are over here. So these were ones that we didn't inoculate into the animals, but we isolated during the trial. And when we took those isolates and we exposed them to the phage, we found that they were 10,000 times more resistant to the phage than these original isolates were. So in that single event, in a trial of about 60 days, these bacteria evolved to become about 10,000 times more resistant to our phage. So that's in a very short period of time. And that evolution is continuing. There's now, the US has just mandated about the new big six serotypes that are also gonna be tested for in beef. And we have a project with Alberta Innovates right now looking at those. Probably the most notorious one was the German 2011 outbreak. The 0104, which was linked to fenugreek sprouts, had nothing to do with beef at all. In that case, 3,950 people got sick, 53 died, and 25% of those individuals who were infected developed hemolytic ureic syndrome, the uh, associated disease that causes kidney failure. So we need to be continuously vigilant, and we need to be vigilant along the entire chain of production. So that includes, but the problem is when we're out in the cattle on pasture, but the number of variables we need to control is much more greater as we move down the line to become less and less. So we started with cattle in the pasture, we moved to cattle in the feedlot. Many of the work, much of the work that we've done is focused on cattle in the feedlot. I've already talked about how we have a number of methods already implemented in our slaughtering processes to control pathogens. We need to be vigilant at the retailer and we need to also take responsibility as individuals at the consumer level as well. And that's the one point, you know, before that goes into your mouth, is the one point where you have ultimate control and it's simply a matter of cooking because E. coli 157 starts to die at about 45 degrees Celsius at that temperature. So that's the one thing as individuals that we can all do. So I'd just like to thank the group of people that work with me, the funders, and then keep in mind that although people go ballistic, when bacteria get upset, they go pathogenic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tim. So a couple of things. The fact that 160 degrees C is what you want in the middle of your burgers that you're barbecuing. So a lot of that, that's a communications issue, right? That's yep. getting that, that word across. But uh, is E. coli 0157 found in wild animals too? Yes. Yeah, it's in a number of different, it's been isolated from uh, rodents, from pigeons, from deer, from uh, flies. It's, it's universal. I think one of the things that's really changed in the last 10 or 15 years is uh, many of these bacteria were thought as strictly living in enteric, inside the intestinal tract of mammals. And we've done studies with E. coli 157, we've found it survives out in the environment for over 300 days. So a lot of these bacteria can survive in other environments, and I think it again goes back to the ability of these bacteria to adapt and persist, and, and to uh, uh, persist in, in various environments. So it isn't entirely that you can't look at the way we raise cattle and say, well, that 
that really is the problem if they're existing naturally anyway. No, the, where, where the cattle plays a role is, is, is a matter of density, you know. It's the same sort of thing if we talk about putting people on airliners, you know, if we increase the density of people, we tra increase disease transmission. It's the same sort of thing. In a feedlot, we can increase the transmission of E. coli 157 amongst animals if we increase the density of those animals as well.